All right, Dr. Gleb, I appreciate you joining me. Uh, I think it was either Brian or Frank that introduced us, um, but the the topic that you talk about and, and the things that you do for people is, is particularly interesting to me because as a business attorney, I'm constantly dealing with business owners who make bad decisions. They don't put things in writing and you know they don't they don't really have a process that they use. Yeah. And I guess that's true in life, not just that. So I told you that I'm 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 in, in the thick of your book, and I I've actually recommended it to half a dozen people. We may be using oh, it for wonderful. one of my book clubs as well. Um, but I mean, it is the heart of really why people really struggle all the time with the decisions that they make. But let me leave it to you to talk a little bit about you know your background and how you got into what you're doing, all the cognitive science, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are. Sure, happy to. So. I've always been interested in decision-making. How do we make decisions? Why do we make decisions the way we do? You know, ever since I was a kid, my parents always told me to go with my gut, trust my heart, follow yeah. my intuition. But so they all say, of, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like right. what, people, what people say, that, that's right. kind of typical advice. But you know what? I mean, I saw my parents making some bad decisions by themselves when they go with their gut. So for example, you know, my dad, he was kind of a cheapskate and my mom liked to buy nice clothing. Yeah. So, you know, and other stuff. So nice. she'd go out, she'd buy a nice, you know, sweater, $100 sweater and she'd come back and then my dad would be, you know, sell her, oh, sweaters should only cost $20, no more than $20. Right. <laughs> and then they'd go into it and, you know, she would bring up past things, he would bring up past things and they would have conflicts. And they had conflicts like this all the time right. because they both went with their gut. They went with their intuitions. They trusted what their heart or their gut, whatever, was telling them to do. And right. then they made bad choices, financially bad choices and relationship-wise bad choices. Sure. Yeah, and that happens. I mean, and I grew up, I was growing up, uh, you know, I was born in 1981. I was 19 at the time, you know, if you remember the 1999, when the, that uh, year of the dot-com boom. Yeah. Um, like pets.com, boo.com and so on, all those internet stocks were booming and then just a couple of years later when i was 21 they all went bust yep. <laughs> you know, all of those but that's a dot-com boom and bust and you know what i saw that they were praised in 1999 in the wall street journal all those places that went bust just a couple of years ago and then they all were criticized they were the villains they went from heroes to zeros you know right. heroes to villains and nothing changed they were making decisions in the same way that they were before. It's just you know, the outcomes were different. Yeah. So that really showed me that, you know, I mean, not simply, it's not simply my parents, it's the titans of industry, you know, talking about entrepreneurs, right? <laughs> titans of industry, not knowing how to make the right decisions, sure. not knowing how to make good decisions. And look at how many bad decisions people made around the pandemic. Many major business industry leaders made around the pandemic. So we can sure. talk about that. Yeah. But yeah. So I was fascinated by that. And I decided I want to study this. I want to study why we make such bad decisions. And that's why how I got into looking at behavioral science, cognitive neuroscience, all of those stuff. So I got a PhD in that topic. Mm -hmm. So I'm a doctor. So that's oh, I've spent over 15 years in academia researching these topics. How do we make decisions, especially in business contexts, but outside of them as well, okay. in relationships and so on. And how do we make decisions badly? And then how do we improve our decision making to actually make good decisions? Sure. What can we do to have evidence-based business? You know, the evidence-based medicine movement has really been taking off since the early aughts, since the 2000, where, you know, people were learning that if you use checklists and if you use various decision-making techniques, you'll make much better health outcomes for right. your patients. Sure. Now we're only at the start of evidence-based business, evidence-based entrepreneurship. How do you use research to make good decisions in business rather than just relying on your gut and your intuitions? Yeah, so that's sure. That's something I've been working on for the last 20 years. And that's been something I've been teaching folks and consulting and coaching on and writing about with my book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. That's where I'm from. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, going with your gut, there's really nothing behind that. Like we don't have, there's, there's no, no, there's not really no such thing. Like what's going with your gut? It makes you feel better. Well, it probably makes you feel better to like buy new things. And that's not always a good thing to do. So I yep. always found that to be like, it's an erroneous conclusion. It's just, it's mm -hmm. what people say because they don't know what else to tell you. Mm -hmm. Well, go, go what you think feels good. Well, that doesn't, that doesn't correspond to anything. 
It doesn't correspond to anything but feeling good. Right. We have to understand At that one particular people. moment, and then you'll feel really right. bad later on. And we have to dig a little deeper and understand where our feelings are coming from. Right. So people tend to trust their feelings. And that's where the go with your gut comes from. Go with what you feel. Your feelings will lead you in the right direction. That's a very common trope in our society. Right. And not simply in business. I mean, in relationships. Oh, yeah, right? sure. You know, and there's a reason that about half of all marriages end in divorce, right? <laughs> Obviously, right. It doesn't yeah. work. It doesn't yeah. work very well at all. Right. Because our feelings are actually not adapted for the modern world. So here's the crux. Our feelings, our intuitions, they come from, they evolved for the savannah environment. When they lived in small tribes. Yeah, to protect people. us, right? Yeah, to protect yeah. us. So first of all, tribalism is a fundamental part of who we are. Right. That means we look for people who look like us, who share our values, who you know, share cultural backgrounds. That was very important in the savannah environment because if we weren't sufficiently tribal, we'd be kicked out of our tribe and we'd die. Right. Or, you know, our tribe, uh, if we weren't sufficiently hostile to other tribes, people right. who we feel different from, then our tribe would be taken over and we'd die as well. So it was like, like such... attracted like, right? Yeah, and hostile to, this, to those who aren't like. Right. And so that tribalism was very beneficial to survival in that environment. Of course. In the modern environment, we have to engage to succeed in our business and in our personal life. We have to successfully engage with people who are very different from us. We're in a yeah, very all kinds of people. world, yeah. very different from us. And we don't, I mean, there's a lot of reasons why we make bad business decisions around people, yeah. around who we collaborate with, right. and it comes from tribalism. So that's kind of one big, big area. Another big area comes with snap judgments. Now, in the Savannah environment, you might, we had what was called, and we still have what's called the fight or flight response. Of course. You know, it was very important to jump at a hundred shadows in order to get away from that one saber tooth tiger, right? Yeah. That, that was the, what we had to do. Otherwise we wouldn't survive. We're the descendants of those who jumped at that hundred shadows. Right. You know, the ones who didn't, didn't survive. Now in the modern environment, there are many, many, many less saber tooth tigers. <laughs> Let's be yeah. honest about that. Right. But business owners, business leaders, entrepreneurs, all sorts of folks in all sorts of decision-making situations act as if they are tigers. They make snap judgments, quick right. judgments, and they feel that their judgments are the right ones. And because they feel their feelings are telling them to make that snap judgment, they trust their feelings, and therefore they jump to conclusions that they shouldn't, which I'm right. sure you as a business attorney know, but that's something that happens very typically is jumping to conclusions without considering data, especially considering data that goes against your intuitions, that goes against your beliefs. That is very hard data to consider, but it's the most important data to consider to make good decisions. Yeah, I think you're, you made a point in the book about um, Blink, right? And, and I like Malcolm yeah. Gladwell. I read all of his stuff. He's a He's a well-written guy. He's a smart guy. But I, I think it's interesting because I think Blink is an erroneous conclusion, not because the book is wrong, but because he's analyzing the difference between people making decisions in a snap and people taking time to make decisions. But if they don't have a process to make those decisions carefully, they're still going to get the same result pretty much. So his That's conclusion right. was just kind of erroneous. It wasn't that... It, it yeah, it really is. It really is. The, the blink conclusion is erroneous and he is using it. He is using the wrong kind of data to make a conclusion. So he's, for example, looking at, let's say, how does someone, a baseball catcher, right? But sports, all business leaders often like sports metaphors, right? right. Catch the ball, you know, right. swing, make the hit or whatever, you know, yeah. the pass. The, yeah, he's big on basketball, stuff. I think, too. Yeah. Basketball, right. Exactly. Right. In basketball, you have to make decisions in the blink of an eye. Yeah. And you have to use your gut intuitions and instincts because you don't have time to think it through. Right. And you, what works in basketball is having muscle memory of going through the same motions numerous times. When you look at the business, at a basketball decision, there are very few actual decisions you can make. And you know, you, you can go at somebody who's standing in front of you, you can go to the left of this guy, to the right of this guy, or right. try to skip under his feet, right? right? So you do the same motions all the time, and therefore you learn, you have muscle memory. 
That is not how business works. Not even not close. At all. No. In business, you have numerous ways of achieving your goals and all situations are different that you're faced with. You can't trust, you don't have muscle memory for making decisions. And so the sports metaphors that business leaders really like to apply to business just simply don't work. And Malcolm Gladwell's sports metaphors just don't work in business settings. They don't carry over. Yeah, they don't carry over. And this is something that folks don't understand that they use the wrong metaphors. You know, it's like so. It's like when politicians tell you, you know, think of the family's budget, uh, think of the country's budget as your family's budget. That's not how the country budget works. <laughs> no, it's not even close. It's not even close. That right. is a false metaphor. And right. it's a political move to try to convince you of something rather than conveying the truthfulness of the situation. Right. So you need to understand that the decisions we make in business, you don't need to make them in the snap, you know, in a blink of an eye. You shouldn't. You shouldn't. Right? And you know, it's not like a basketball game. It's something where you can take the time to think it through and you need to have a good process for you thinking it through, which the book talks about, talks about a number of processes to make decisions. So you want to make sure that you're using good processes to make decisions. You're not making them in the blink of an eye and you're using good data and you're not just following your heart and trusting your gut. Yeah. Well, I think that's why, and I, 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 look, I'm not a neuroscientist like you, but I study this as a business lawyer. That's why I see people who are successful in business, let's say in a particular industry, it's because they know that industry so well that it is almost like the way they're operating their business is almost like muscle memory. And then they go into some other business, they don't have processes, how they make, and they don't, and they fail because it doesn't carry over. The ones I know that are constantly successful, that's exactly what they have. They have a ways that they make decisions, ways that they evaluate things so they can limit their mistakes and over time, they've become educated as to how they should make decisions in various scenarios. But most people just like the accidental entrepreneur, they learn by accident. And it's not a really a good way to, um, you know, that's like I told you, I'm carrying your torch because I probably <laughs> recommended the book to half a dozen people. And, you know, it's like it, it's it's like the thing that I was missing. Like I'm telling I talk all the time about putting things in writing. Right. If you're a business yeah. owner, you don't make agreements with people by shaking their hand, because you and I both know, especially especially being the cognitive neuroscience area that you are, people's memories are very, very, very imperfect, right? We have like a a box in our head, we stuff everything in, and then we try to pull things out, it's all stuck to each other. It's nothing that's organized about your memory. Well, so if you don't use a process where you run your business and you have it in writing, you're just going to have problems all the time. And I guess it's the same with decision making, right? We're just really bad at it. We are really bad at it and we don't understand how bad we are. Right. Because we well, because nobody teaches good. us anything. Right. Right. We feel good about our decisions. Yeah. We feel confident in our decisions. One of the biggest cognitive biases. So cognitive biases are the specific dangerous judgment errors that come from how our brain is wired. So okay. when you've heard hear the term cognitive biases, that's what they're about. So these mm-hmm. cognitive biases, one of the biggest problems for entrepreneurs is called the overconfidence bias, where yeah. we tend to be very <laughs> confident about our decisions. Right. And entrepreneurs tend to be much more confident in their decisions than most people. Right. And this confidence is if you, like you said yourself, if you have been in a similar business that goes in the same way for a long time, then you know, okay, here are the processes, you kind of learn it, you get muscle memory. Right. But there are two big problems with that. Well, several problems. One is the problem you named when you go into a separate business. Right, you now think you're good at it just because you were good at the other one. Exactly, that's a big problem, that does not work. (laughs) Now, The second problem comes when there's a disruption. You use it. So, for example, the pandemic is one disruption. 2008, 2009 fiscal crisis is another disruption. Yeah. You know, rise of the smartphones for a number of industries was a major disruption. You know, for grocery stores, when Amazon and so on went into grocery store delivery, the delivery business, that's a major disruption. Right. When you're in a disruption situation and you try to use the same processes that you did before, it just doesn't work. You've got intuition. It does not work. Right. So that's a second example where it doesn't work. Okay. The third bit example is when you're growing bigger. It's notoriously very well known that entrepreneurs tend to fail when they're going to a certain higher stage of business. Right. So, for example, when you're going from the 10th 
10 people stage to the 50 people stage. Right. Why is that? Well, because you know how to manage 10 people directly. Right. It's a different reports. skill set, right? And it's a different skill set to manage right. a team of people who manage a team of people. Right. That's a very different skill set. So that is, you know, that that's a level where that's a lot why of a lot of entrepreneurs get thrown out of their companies when the company's yeah. big now and they have to bring in a real CEO. Yep. Because it's a totally different skill set. You're absolutely right. So kind of that level between the kind of that 10 where you can directly control people and where you have to control others who control people or direct reports. Then the next level is when it goes over 100, that's a big, big gap because then you have to create a culture for the company. It's not, you're, not, you're no longer managing a team of people who manage all the people. You're managing a team of people who manages a team of people who manage a team right, of people. You may not have much direct contact with. Exactly. Yeah. So then that's where you need to create a culture for a company. You, create, you need to create the, the co company culture. Entrepreneurs don't realize that they, need, that they need to do that. They can't personally carry everything forward. Right. So this is a big, big challenge. So these are the three big areas where people tend to fail when they have been doing well in their enterprise for a while. Going into a different area when there's a disruption or when they're growing bigger to next significant level. Yeah, I, I, you know, I talk to a lot of business owners at different levels, and I say one of the things that you have to look at from a from let's say from a business planning standpoint, right? Because it should go on all the time, is the people side of your business and recognize that it's not necessarily a shortcoming of you to recognize what the limits of your skills are, mm -hmm. and when you need someone else to run that business or to help you run the business or to bring in an outside consultant to help you build teams and learn that type of stuff. And maybe you can't do it. Uh, maybe you yes. can't, but you got to find the people that, that can. And a lot of people don't evaluate that. And like you said, maybe it's an ego thing. Maybe it's a security thing. They're, they're overconfident. Um, but the, the overconfidence, I think, is attractive to the entrepreneur, right? The person who's not mm -hmm. confident is not going to become an entrepreneur. They're going to stay yes. at a company. They're going to get a job. But it, it, you know, there's obviously a, a, a happy medium in there where the business owner himself has to recognize that, hey, I got to be careful here. If I'm overconfident, I got to have some processes in place that deals with overconfidence. Mm -hmm. You're right? absolutely right. So overconfidence is a big issue. Then the other issue for entrepreneurs, which is related, it's called the optimism bias being too optimistic about the future. Right. And this is something I'm prone to. So I'm an entrepreneur. I, built, I have a six people company called Disaster Avoidance Experts, the consulting, coaching and training company. Mm -hmm. And so I understand that myself. You know, I think, I feel that the world is a place full of opportunities. I right. feel that the grass is green on the other side of the hill. Of I feel well, it's the a little hard to get up in the morning if you're not optimistic about what's going to happen. Well, I mean, pessimistic people, uh, they suffer from the opposite cognitive bias, where right. they feel that the grass is yellow on the other side of the hill, and they feel the world is full of threats. They definitely get up in the morning, but it's more motivated by anxiety rather than by optimism. Right. You know, right. They need to protect yourself from yeah. risks, from problems. So entrepreneurs are much, much more oriented toward opportunities, but that means that they're not seeing a lot of the rocks under, you know, the, right. under the, their yacht. So yeah. that's, that's a big, big problem. And that's a problem for me I, because I tend to be too optimistic and I tend to not see the kind of failures that might be coming my way. So there are lots of ways, there are lots of ways to address that. One of the ways to address that is to make sure to hire pessimistic people for your company, which I make sure to do for my company. You know, I'm the kind of person who has 20 ideas before breakfast and I think they're all brilliant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, right. that's something I've learned to my better experience is they're not all brilliant. But imagine if all the other six, five people at my company who had the same attitude, then we'd have 120 ideas yeah, you'd have before a problem. breakfast right. and we'd be reinforcing each other's ideas because we'd be like, yes, this is great. And we'd be running in 120 different directions. And you know, one of the, Two top two reasons why enterprise why startups fail is because they run out of cash. Right. They run out of cash because they would have been profitable, but they're pursuing too many different projects and they're not pursuing the one that's the most profitable. And that is a problem for people who fired who hire too many optimistic folks on their team. I make sure to hire pessimistic folks. So you want like a balance, basically? Yeah, exactly. So you know, I give, I give them my 20 brilliant ideas and they say, well, these are all half baked potatoes. <laughs> you know, maybe these three are worth finishing baking. And they take these three half baked ideas and they finish baking them, they improve them and they implement them. You know, pessimistic people are bad at generating ideas. That's not their strong suit because they inherently see the exaggerated flaws of each idea, right. but they're great at evaluating ideas. 
and they're great at improving them and they're great at implementing them. So that's their strength. Right. And so what you need to do is realize, you know, I like to work with other optimists. It feels good to be my feelings. Of tell course. me to hire other optimists because they reinforce my ideas and they right. don't criticize Yay, them. Everything's it's, great. Exactly. It, it feels good. Till it fails. But you know, yeah. I know that that's, you know, one of the techniques and that I talk about in the book to uh, is consider the alternative, consider the, the opposite. And that is, uh, and getting an external perspective is another technique I talk in the book. So those two techniques work very well when optimistic people hire pessimistic people for their team. And they need to give these pessimistic people specific support for being a devil's advocate. You know, you want to hire at least two pessimistic people on your team to for the decision making process because they need to reinforce each other and they need to be supported in being devil's advocates. They need to be praised for criticizing your ideas and other people's ideas because otherwise, you know, they'll be they feel like they're going to lose their job, right? Exactly. Yeah. So they don't want to do that. You right. want to make sure to support them, praise them, promote them for for criticizing ideas. And that's going to get you much further than just yeah. having optimistic people, you know. So that's something is, that is. Is a it very one of the computer technique. companies? Maybe it's Google, that's known for doing that. Somebody comes up to me, develops something new. I think you're thinking new. of Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft so, does that. Okay. Yeah, Bill what? Gates has. Uh, well, when he used to run Microsoft, he had kind of a, a, a week long retreat where he looked at all the, the things that might be threats to Microsoft. It's uh, uh, kind of the paranoia. <laughs> yeah. So the, 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 that's when it, there's also corner. a company, I, I'm not, I don't, maybe it was Microsoft, where if somebody, let's say a team developed something, a new piece of software, a new piece of hardware, th they would reward the other teams for breaking it, for figuring out how it doesn't work, mm. why it doesn't work. You know, it, maybe the programming's wrong. Maybe it's people don't use it that way. Whatever it was, I, I forget yeah. which it company might be, it was. It might it's not Oracle. Be Microsoft, oh. but I know that Microsoft definitely has that paranoid vigilance yeah. of scanning the environment and looking for the kinds of threats. I mean, this is one of the reasons that Bill Gates successfully predicted the upcoming pandemic and why you know. Kind of, so he did definitely a good job with that. Yeah, he saw it coming. Yep. But I think it still gets down to right. You have to have a process. Yes. as to how you evaluate things and you need to stick to those basic principles regardless of how confident you are about the idea or maybe how worried you are about the idea or whatever because if you yes. don't stick to those principles you're just going to go off track every single time you're absolutely right having a process is incredibly important so having your systems written down having a process and you want to make sure that you show the process to other people get their feedback to improve the process so have a way of improving the process over time because you know don't assume that it's perfect right. but you want to make sure to go for the process because otherwise so one of the other cognitive biases that people might have heard of this is the most famous one it's called the confirmation bias where we look for information that confirms our beliefs and right. we ignore information that doesn't right and so that causes us to simply sweep aside any information that says that maybe our beliefs about the right people to hire or what the market will appreciate will not work. And then ignore information, look for information that supports our beliefs and no cherry picking data, right? So I told you one of the two reasons why startups fail, running out of cash because of too many different projects. The other big reason why they fail is a lack of fit of product to market. A lack of fit of product to market. I mean, about half of all startups fail within the first five years, and about three quarters fail within the first 15 years for those two reasons. Right. Those are the major reasons for failure. And lack of fit of product to market comes from confirmation bias, where you don't look for information that confirms your beliefs and you only look for information that does confirm your beliefs. So that lack of fit of product to market, very big problem. Confirmation bias really screws entrepreneurs all the time. Yeah, well, I, the ones I know that are successful constantly test. They're asking their customers all the time, what do you like about this? What do you don't like about this? A lot mm -hmm. of them discover that what they thought people are interested in and why they use a product or a service isn't even close to what they think mm -hmm. the real reason is, you know? And, and a lot of yeah. people, like you said, you ask four of your friends and you're like, well, I checked with everybody. I mean, everybody, <laughs> right? And that's like their whole, their whole, uh, what, what do they call those, um, you know, uh, market study groups, right? They, <laughs> that was their whole mar marketing plan. And as small business owners, you have to, you know, send out surveys, call 10 of people that you, that you trust, ask them to be honest and tell them, mm -hmm. why don't you use this? What's good about it? What's bad about it? And those are the best ones. I just talked to a woman last week. She has a business. It basically 
it's, you know, like corporate promotional items where you put your logo on things. Yes. Right. So she said, well, everyone does that. So they started a company that manages those programs and also mm -hmm. provides the product to corporations, large corporations. Right. So instead mm -hmm. of you going out and saying, oh, you like this pen, you like they manage everything. I mean, you don't send out anything. They send out the programs, keep in touch, appreciation, all that type of stuff. When she got started, she started by interviewing people, 10, 20, 30, 50, 100 people. And she said it was it was just mind blowing how how off I was mm. thinking why somebody would use this service, what their needs were, what they were concerned with about the relationships with their customers. And I learned so much that we became experts as doing this, but we still do it every quarter. We're talking to people. We're always looking mm -hmm. for she's the pessimist. She's the one who's saying, I got to find out what's what am I missing? Mm -hmm. What am I doing wrong? What am I not doing for the customer? And those people are successful, but she has a process yes. now as to how she does it every single time. Uh, that's excellent. And that's something that would definitely serve her well. And that is a very rare thing for an entrepreneur to very look for rare. information that goes against their beliefs and goes against their intuitions. Right. Because it feels bad. And so we have to understand, you know, we've been talking about feelings for a while, and we have to understand how important feelings are. Typically in business, we underestimate the importance of feelings, but feelings determine 80 to 90% of our decision making when we just go ahead and let them determine our decision making. Let's go with because, your gut, but, right? Do you feel yeah. good about it? Do you not yeah, feel good? Do you good feel about good it? about it? Do you yeah. feel good about this idea? Do you feel good about hiring this person or not? You know, you'll. I feel good about hiring other optimists. I feel bad about hiring other pessimists, but I know that for the sake of my company, it, to hire other pessimists. And there, these sorts of things happen all the time where for the sake of your bottom line, for the sake of your success, you need to go with things that feel bad, right. that feel uncomfortable, that go against your intuitions. Because our intuitions are, again, aren't wired for the modern world. And that's the big danger. So you need to learn about all these cognitive biases that are described in my book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters. There are 30 cognitive biases that are the most important for business leaders to learn about and address. That's what the book is about. Yeah. Now you can look at the list of over 100 on Wikipedia. So you can go ahead right now, right. list of Wikipedia, over 100 of them. So check those out. The, I narrowed down to the 30 most dangerous ones and specifically how they apply to businesses and then how do you actually address each one of them using debiasing techniques. So that's what you need to understand that these sorts of things, you know, you've learned about these sorts of things in other areas of your life. I mean, think about your diet, right? It's very tempting when you're, let's say a grateful vendor sends you a box of donuts and somebody right. puts it down the, in the break room. So you pass by it and there's a you know, delicious dozen donuts. And you know, you, you're very tempted, you take half a donut. And then like, you don't want to leave the, the half a donut for every, for somebody else. You take the other, the, the half, and right. then you're triggered by sugar. So you take another donut and a yeah. third. And before you're you know it, half the box now. is gone. It's like crack. <laughs> exactly. Like, yeah. you know, of course, the, not that it happened to me, right? Right. So this, it, why does this happen? Why does it happen that we're so triggered by sugar? Well, because in the savannah environment, we need it to eat as much sugar as possible to survive. So we are the descendants of those who were strongly triggered by sugar, whether it was apples, bananas, honey. Right. And if we didn't, the ones who weren't strongly triggered by sugar, they didn't survive and thrive and reproduce. So we are very much triggered by sugar in the modern world. That's a problem in the modern world now it is, where yeah. there is an overabundance of sugar, but we're still very triggered by sugar. So hopefully you have developed some techniques for overcoming that, you know, maybe passing by those dozen donuts and going for the bowl of fruit another grateful vendor sent over. Right. And whatever other techniques you have for addressing the diet. I mean, many people still struggle with it. There is a reason there's an obesity epidemic in this country, right? right. So this is Big a problem. Time. Yeah. But you have hopefully developed those habits, diet habits, exercise habits for your physical health. You, the same needs to be done for your mental health in your decision making. You want to make sure that you are mentally healthy and that mental health has to do with understanding your emotions and being able to manage them. And understanding your emotions and being able to manage them when you make decisions is about learning about these cognitive biases and about how do you take the steps to address each of these cognitive biases. Because right. otherwise you're going to make very bad decisions eventually you know, and you are going to really miss out on a lot of opportunities. Yeah, well, I, I think it's what you just said, right? It's about understanding and it's about consciousness. Like a lot of 80% of what we do is just learning that it exists. 
Yeah. So if we recognize that we are probably overly optimistic and we need some pessimistic people to balance out what our decision making is and we need a process and we put things in writing and we learn about the cognitive biases that you talk about and all the other ones i mean that's right that's 80 percent of the game just knowing that it's that right that you're subject to all that stuff i mean absolutely sugar is the same thing right it's hidden in all of our food so as you get smarter about what you're eating and you know making better decisions and cleaner eating you can do that but if you're totally ignorant to what's in food and what constitutes sugar, because there's all kinds of things that aren't even called sugar, right? Sure. You can't make those decisions. But I think, like you said, it's an understanding of, like, there's a there's a point where they find your book, they read your book, they start learning about these things. Maybe some people do some extra research, which, like you said, is not so hard. Yep. Now, whenever I learn something in a book, I always do extra. It's sure. easy now, right? And then start to gain a consciousness of decision making, doing it with your eyes open. That's the problem is that they just don't even recognize that what they're doing is because like you said, everyone told them, well, you got to go with your gut. I'm not even sure what that means. Right. So you're out there doing these things. You're hurting yourself and you don't, you won't know it till it's, till it fails. You won't know it until that point. You're absolutely right. And that is why I called the book, never go with your gut. It's a startling statement and it's the essential message that I want to send you know, that 80% of the message is being conscious that your gut shouldn't be trusted, your emotions shouldn't be trusted, right? You have muscle memory in certain situations, and your experience leads you to make good decisions in very narrow situations. But when the situation changes in a number of ways, you'll make mistakes, and you might already be making a lot of mistakes and not realizing it, you know, right, maybe your profit margins are 10%, and they should be 30%. Because yeah. the you know, that that's a fundamental, maybe you mistake. think they're 30%, and they're really only 10%. Maybe, yeah. but kind of when I go, when I do coaching for folks, and they bring me in, they, when I look at their business, what's going on, they often bring me in for, you know, a strategic retreat or something like that. And then I take a look at their everyday operations and I say, did you know that you're really screwing yourself over and here, (laughs) here, and here, you know, the kind of people that you're hiring, the leadership team, why are you spending your time on correcting? I mean, uh, there was a coaching client who I found out relatively, I've been coaching him for about four months. I found out relatively recently, because we just didn't talk about this area, we talked about strategy. I found out relatively recently that he spends a lot of his time correcting other people's mistakes, looking after their mistakes. And this is, he's running a 60 people company and he's looking after their mistakes. He's trying to correct them. He's trying to address them. And I'm like, why are you spending your valuable precious time this right. way? Why can't you have another member of the leadership team do this? Why is this the way that you use your time? You should be spending your time much more strategically. But the thing is, he his business got to the level like i said he used to be run a 10 people company now he runs a 60 people company right. in a 10 people company yeah it's your job as a manager essentially to look at other people's mistakes and check them out in a 60 people company that's not your job your job is to hire somebody else or to direct somebody else to look for other people's mistakes or quality management and so on right. so on that everyday level the way and he uses his time and he's frustrated he's anxious he's tired because he's right. over- with all these yeah, you can't do that for 60 people exactly yeah. exactly and so that is a bad way of spending your time and he, people just don't realize it that this is a bad way of spending their time they don't realize how much stress they can be avoiding they don't realize how many mistakes and how much loss to their bottom line they can be avoiding they don't realize how much anxiety and frankly depression sadness they can be avoiding by making sure they make good decisions and working smart not hard yeah, well, they're afraid. They think they if they don't do it, it's going to fall apart and they don't have a process in place. I, I think a lot of people, you say, never go with your gut and you don't trust your decision. doesn't mean you're stupid. doesn't mean you're not capable of it. just recognizes that we're all human and our brains work a certain way that we can't really control. I get in more legal situations where, you know, you're arguing with your partner and, and I'm like, well, what does the contract say? And they look, well, we didn't put any of this in writing. Well, that's why you're having an argument because you don't remember things and you don't have a process. And I think that we could probably, uh, look, you can't guarantee things, right? Right? But you could increase people's chance of success if they had a process where they could recognize a lot of these biases. Nobody's perfect, right? But, you know. And this is incredibly important. Nobody's perfect and we are all biased. 
you know, I'm biased, like I said, the optimism bias is a big problem for me. I have other biases, which are, which I still struggle with. So nobody's perfect. And you need to learn about these things, just like nobody's perfect in their diet. You know, you have to learn to how to eat well in the modern world. It's not something, you know, you look at babies, babies like to eat sugar. They like to eat candies. Nobody is born liking salad. You know? <laughs> that's the, that's just not something we're born with. You're not born liking salad. You have to do, acquire taste for it. You have to develop a taste for it. So if you have, if you take care of your physical fitness, and then you just don't just do what feels natural to you for your physical fitness, for your, you know, exercise, whatever, you need to do the same thing for your mental fitness, because we're not, you know, all, nobody is the perfect rational robot who makes the right decisions about business all the time. That's just not the way we work. That's not what we are evolved for. So you need to understand, like you said, that we need to develop processes and systems, recognizing cognitive biases is fundamental to this. And the cognitive biases explain why we need these processes, because we're not perfect, we're not robots. So you need to develop processes that are specifically customized to addressing these cognitive biases and writing things that, that down is one part of such a process, making sure that you don't trust, simply trust your memory because your memory is fallible, very much vulnerable to the confirmation bias and other problems. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, the smartest, the, not the smartest, the ones that I know that have the best memories, their memories get confused. Absolutely. It's just the way it all, the way it all works, but I, I appreciate it. So I assume that if somebody wants to read the book, they can get it on Amazon, right? Everything's on Amazon right. these days. It's on Amazon, it's in Barnes Noble, it's in stores near you. So it's published by Career Press, which is a great press and it's published everywhere. They, there's an audible version. So if you like audiobooks, check it out on Audible. There's physical and digital, obviously. So check those out as well. I didn't know there was an audible version. I would have definitely got that. Listen to it all oh. the way back from Indiana. I want to listen to the whole thing, but I appreciate you coming on the show. Um, what's the best way for people to interact with you if they want to find you online, see what you're doing, learn from you? They should check out my website called disasteravoidanceexperts.com that has all my blogs, podcasts, videos, coaching, consulting services, books, of course, you can get, go to all of my books from there. And especially check out the free wise decision maker course. So disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe. It's a free course, eight video based modules. And the first module has an assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace, these cognitive biases. Okay. Goes for all the 30 cognitive biases, sees which ones you are most vulnerable to, like I'm most vulnerable to the optimism bias. So you want to learn about that. So that's again, disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe. Okay, great. We'll put a link in the show notes. I appreciate you coming on, spending your time with me and uh, you take care out in uh, Columbus. Thank you very much, Mitch. I appreciate that. All right, Dr. This Club. is a great show.